we got to talk about the basic, the thing that we're all going to need if we want to be on the internet, and that is... A modem. Well, yeah, but pay that, for com Comcast. That, that comes from your oh, provider. Oh, right. The router. <laughs> oh, but yeah. actually, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because in a lot of cases, the mm -hmm. modem and the router are the same. Uh, and in those cases, I usually hate them, especially I, I hate if them the lot. case is Comcast. Yeah, yeah it's, it used to be that your provider, be it your DSL provider or your cable provider, or back in my day, your, you know, what? ISDN provider, wow. your T1 provider, they would give you <laughs> what was essentially an entrance into their network. And that came on like a little horse and buggy kind of contraption, they of dropped course. that off. Yeah, yeah, it was dropped off by storks and pelicans. Yeah. It's right. like, oh, I got a brand new internet. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, it was kind of slow back in my day. Thank you for reminding me that. But the whole idea was that device gave you real internet. Uh -huh. So it was your real address, it was your real connection to the internet, and then it was your job to have some sort of device mm -hmm. that would allow you to turn that one address or, or two, three, four, a dozen addresses into something that you could actually use. Okay, okay. Well, just bef right before we get to the routers, because it does go from the modem to the router in most cases, my the thing I've had I have an older modem that I actually uh, bought right. and I paid for and so it's you know it's paid for itself because I don't have to rent it anymore from the uh, ISP, but they've been calling me telling yeah. me I need a new modem. You do okay. And I bought one, but I have not put it in, yeah. and it's still the old one's still working. <laughs> well, the old one may be working, but you're probably not getting the most speed. So mm. what they've done over the t over time is they've upgraded the the uh, the version of Doxis. That's the communications protocol that they use in order to connect your computer to their network. Mm -hmm. The older ones will work as they're backwards compatible, but the older ones typically don't allow as many channels, as much speed, as much bandwidth. Okay. Now, if you're not using a lot, then you may not notice it, but I mean... I'm yeah. locked in at 35 down, 5 up. They probably You could probably get more in mm, this area. Okay. So you may want to do that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm with you. I used to love to buy, because I didn't like paying a rental fee more recently. I've I've just kind of surrendered because <laughs> you've given up. I've given wow. up because like with Cox with my uh, my family up mm -hmm. in Las Vegas, they have to use Cox cable, and Cox would do something where it would require if you bought it, you'd have to like rebuy one every twelve months, and that was annoying. It was and it was like well yours will work, but you may notice dropouts or then this is the worst case scenario something happens, your network doesn't work, and now they say, well, you bought the modem, and it's not ours, so we can't be responsible for it, so go screw. Uh, it makes me so sad, though, yeah. especially since they've beaten you down, who's usually the person who's the well, most... Well, I mean, if it was my personal modem, I would absolutely do that, but I yeah, mean, it's like... It's your, I, you don't want to have to deal with I it because it's it your remotely. family stuff. Yeah, yeah, I can't, yeah, I can't tell my parents, yeah, you're just not going to have the internet for the next three weeks before I get there. <laughs> Okay, no. Or, Dad, did you touch the modem or router again? Because <laughs> it it's wasn't in the like wrong this. side yeah. of the house, Dad. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump into routing. Now, when we think about routing, this is the core language of the internet. This mm -hmm. is how the internet works. I mean, a, a lot of people know the story of the internet. It was a DARPA project. The whole idea is, could you make a redundant sort of self-healing network, a network that could route communications mm -hmm. from one point to another, even if you disrupt local nodes. Because before that, our idea of networking was something like token ring, where you would literally have a physical ring of computers, wow. and it would pass a token, which was permission to speak, down the ring. And if you removed it from any of those nodes, suddenly the entire thing went down. Wow. Because okay. you had an empty node on your ring, right? Right, right. That makes sense, though, in the early days. Yeah, and in the early days, say, you don't remember this, but I remember <laughs> when, like, one person would decide to move his computer, so he, like, pulls all the plugs out from the back of his computer. Mm -hmm. It took down the entire network. Wow, yeah. I mean, we wouldn't put up that with that not, today. That is not sustainable. No, no. totally <laughs> not. But back then, it was like, we were, networking was so new. It was like, oh, they're connected. Well, it's not connected right now, but when it's connected, it's whoa! It's pretty cool. We can send each other a message, maybe. <laughs> well, back then, you got to remember that the network stacks are really insecure. So it was, I could take over your computer. <gasps> ah. But then what could you even do with that computer? No, I make solitaire. Print something out on the dot matrix you printer? Know, I'm feeling so much hate. <laughs> it's not hate. elders it's not of computing. Hate. I don't know. I'm, I'm just trying up. to appreciate the nostalgia, that's all. All right, let's get back into the nostalgia. Let's talk a little bit about what it means to route. Because a lot of people, since your magic box has both a router and a switch, and probably wireless as well, mm -hmm. they kind of conflate them. They think routing is the same thing as switching. And it looks like that because 
Even the plugs are the same. Yeah, they have blinky lights. Just like both of them just blink at me. Precisely. Uh, so they must speak the same. Not necessarily. Yeah. Even though on the back of your consumer router, both the WAN port and the LAN ports are using Ethernet, the core technology governing each is slightly different. So when yeah. we're talking about switching, we're talking about multiple computers connected to the same switch, right? Right. Well, that switch needs to figure out a way to direct communications, uh, Ethernet frames, from this computer to this computer. So what it will do is it actually, that switch, the memory inside that switch, keeps a table of everything that's connected to it. Mm -hmm. All the different computers, right? Because remember, every computer has a MAC address. That's a unique, you know, that little 16-digit alphanumeric thing right. that is unique to that computer. Identifies and so, it, yeah. Right. The first time you, you turn on the switch and turn on the device, that registers with the port that it's connected to. It keeps it in memory. It says, oh, anytime I get communications for this mm -hmm. MAC address, it's connected to that port. Right. And then it also assigns an IP address to it, right? Well, IP is later on. So IP is okay. higher up in the stack. But uh, at the switch okay. level, you're only speaking in those frames, those Ethernet frames. Oh, okay. 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 Here's the thing. This is great. This works really, really well. Because the way we used to do it was we used to use hubs. <laughs> and hubs were just repeaters. So all they did was any traffic it got, it, just it, sent, out. it sent out to all the ports. It's like, <laughs> hey, is this any of you? Right. And the one computer that was it was like, that's oh, me. But everyone else could hear. It, it'd be like air, all your neighbors in, mm -hmm. a, in your apartment building yelling at each other every time they want to talk. <laughs> okay, yeah, that would be irritating. Irritating. What and is, it would be insecure, yeah. Very insecure. And what a switch will do, a switch will actually, after the first time, once it's registered who is who, mm -hmm. When your communication frame goes out and it says from this computer to this computer, it will only deliver to the port to which that computer is connected to. Mm -hmm. And so it'd be like picking up the phone and actually dialing someone in that apartment building. Much more efficient, mm -hmm. and it seems like, oh, that's a great way to communicate. Yeah, totally. Except this. <laughs> what if you're not connecting 64 apartments or 100 apartments or even 1,000 apartments? What if you're connecting like 100 million apartments? <laughs> the table that you would have to maintain Right. To know where everything goes would be unimaginably large. It's just, it's unserviceable. Yeah, and then try and search through it to find the one that you need. Yeah, that would be insane. Yeah, you, can't, you can't do it. So, we have routing. Routing is not switching. They, mm -hmm. they look the same if you're just thinking about, well, I connect to this, I connect to this. But routing, rather than using a table, a complete table of everything that's connected, mm -hmm. it, instead it has what's, what are called route tables. So it's like, so like well, a I subset kind, kind of? of exactly. It's like, I don't know exactly. Let's say I want to go from this computer to this computer, mm -hmm. and it's connected from here to here. That's connected to this one and this one. That one's connected to that. That's connected to this one. That over to there. Some <laughs> some weird, right? It's so a weird web. That's how the internet is. The internet is just this weird interconnection of different networks. Right. But what routing will do, specifically BGP, Border Gateway Protocol, hmm. it will allow me to not exactly know where the computer is that I'm trying to communicate, but to know enough that I think it's probably in that direction. Okay. okay. So all of these routers will keep at least a little bit of the direction, the map that hmm. packets need to be sent in order to reach their destination. And so we'll go from here and say, look, I'm looking for 10.50.50.50. And this one will say, well, I don't know where 10.50.50.50 is, but I know where 10.50 is. And then we'll send it over here. And then it's the same question. Maybe that goes to there, that goes to there. Then it goes over to here. Right, right. That's how routing works. Hmm. This is super simplified, by the way. If you want me to get crazy complicated, you got to watch my other show this week at Enterprise <laughs> Tech. That's not what we're here for. But okay. in a nutshell, that's the difference between routing and switching. When I'm routing, I'm going between networks. Right. When I'm switching, I'm going between devices on the same network. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. I can, I can knowledge I can absorb that. I, I mean, I do have a question about, is that what DNS is then? Uh, yes. I don't want you to have to go too deep. No, 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 no. This, actually, this is, this is important because DNS has recently become very important because people are attacking it. Right. I don't actually need DNS. Mm -hmm. ever, if I know the IP address. So right. if I know the IP address of a server, like I used to have a block of IPs that are memorized because they were mine and I had servers on them. Mm -hmm. uh, or for example, like OpenDNS is 208.67.220.220. Google DNS is 8.8.8.8. Yeah. yeah, so there are a couple numbers that you remember, but those are all IPv4, by the way. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, 
What DNS does is it allows me to have a service that uh, when I type in Reuters.com, mm -hmm. I don't have to remember that Reuters is 12.13.52.12. Right. It actually looks it up. It says, hey, what is Reuters? And it will say, oh, Reuters is this IP address, and mm -hmm. then that's what it sends out. So when I'm talking to another router, mm -hmm. I'm not saying where's CNN or where's Fox or where's Banggood. I'm saying where is this IP address? DNS allows me to resolve a okay. name back to the IP. Okay, so it's kind of like a routing table. Yeah, ish. yeah, it's yeah, it's a, the same idea. You keep a table of what is what. Okay, okay, right. cool. So that's routing, and it's important for us to know this because that device, that magic box, mm -hmm. is part switch and part router. Those LAN ports are all switched. Right. That uh, WAN port, mm -hmm. that's actually, that, that makes, that's a routing port. That's right. connected to another network. That connects your network. To the, the world ne network. Well, the World Wide Web. The, the no? network of your ISP, which ah, is yeah. connected to the world. <laughs> you got to remember, this is all layers and layers of connectivity. You're right. right. It's an onion of, of internet. And like onions, they make you cry. <laughs> There's a few ogres out there, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's get back to the basics. We've already okay. talked about... The, uh, what a switch will do. We'll talk, mm -hmm. We've talked about how it keeps a table. We've talked about how routing actually jumps from network to network until it reaches its destination, and then it can come back because it kind of has a map already, right? Right. But here's the, the fun thing. With this, because everything is in interconnected, if I lose a node, there should theoretically be enough interconnectedness between all the different networks that make up the internet mm -hmm. that I can still find a path. It may not be the shortest path anymore, but I should still be able to go around any damaged or unresponsive node of the internet. Okay, so it's kind of like a, a redundancy plan or something. Yeah, well, that's, that's what it was built for. Cool. Yeah. So when we're talking about routers, there's a couple of different ones. There's the edge router. That's what we have. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's to think of a network as a big circle. The edge, it hangs off the edge, right? So that's, those are the little edge routers. Those, those are me, right? Like this might be my ISP. Right. All the edge router is designed to do is it's designed to take the routed traffic and turn it into something my network can understand. Mm -hmm. But then we take a step back up from the edge, and from the edge you get the sub sub subscriber edge, and that might be like Comcast. Okay. Or AT and T. Or Cox. Or, or Cox, right? So those the the subscriber edge routers are designed to connect to the edge routers. Mm -hmm. Go one more step up, and now we have the border routers. The border routers are, well, they're the ones, the big iron, that connect across networks. So imagine this. Imagine your router has to carry your traffic, mm -hmm. right? Go a step up. So then the ISP router has to handle all their subscribers' traffic? Right, precisely, yeah. exactly. So that, that subscriber edge has to handle all the traffic of all the edge routers connected to it. So it has to be a bit more, well, actually, a lot more powerful. Okay. Go a step up. The routers that connect subscribers together. Yeah. And remember, those subscriber routers are connected to all those edge routers. They have to be really big. Yeah. And they have to have a lot of power and a lot of memory to be able to handle that, right? Hmm. I'd like to see one of these facilities. I've got one, if you'd you like. Do? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and then you go one more step up, and it's, it's you know, now we're kind of splitting hairs. We're talking about the backbone routers. And these are the big boys from HP and from Cisco and from Huawei. Huh. And all they do all day is route all of the traffic between, like, it's, it's to which the internet is connected. It wow. is basically the internet. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, right? I, w I want to see these, actually. Oh, uh, you know, you could Maybe watch someday. This Weekend in a Press Talk. Every, yeah? Every is there Friday a show that we're talking about Is there a show this? on the Twit TV network that talks about <laughs> enterprise technology? No. Could it be. would never happen. No. It would never happen. No, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, but we're not talking about that stuff. We're, mm -hmm. we're bringing it in just so that people understand you're one little piece of a huge, huge network. Right. But let's talk about what your router does, because your router is different. It is, it is a router but it's a router with some built-in functions for consumers. Right, right. right. Okay. And there's four main functions that you have to think of when you buy a router. Mm -hmm. The first is NAT, Network Address Translation. Mm -hmm. The second is DHCP, Dynamic Host Control Protocol. Mm -hmm. The third is the firewall, which is actually linked into the NAT functionality. And the fourth, and this is, this is actually relatively recent, wireless. Okay. So those are the four pieces that we kind of expect. When we buy anything from a budget router up to the high-end router for the home, 
it, it's got to include those four pieces. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Because yeah. you look, you just want to connect the devices that you have at home. And if you've ever had a gaming console, you've probably run into a NAT problem before. Exactly. So let's talk about NAT. NAT is Network Address Translation. Some people don't know why we have NAT, and uh, again, the older people will. And the reason <laughs> why we, we have NAT is because back in the 80s, I know, yeah, the, the world existed. The 80s, you say? 80s. Oh, okay. We were alive. There were people before uh, me? <laughs> young people. Okay. <laughs> okay, back in the 80s, IPv4, that's the, uh, the you know, IP addressing, that's the scheme number four, mm -hmm. which was based on like, uh, you know, f four octets. Right. Uh, basically, you know, 256 values, 256 values, 256 values, 256 values. Well, multiply that, you get a whole lot of possibilities. And we thought, that's so much, You'll we'll never, never need that. Yeah. It's, you know, back when the internet was still really, really small. Right. And we were able to, like, for example, I owned a class B. I owned a chunk of the internet. And they just gave it to me because we were a company and we did some research. <laughs> and I gave it back, but I shouldn't right. have because the thing would have been worth millions. But huh. uh, you got to remember, back then, every device we connected to the internet was actually connected to the internet. You, you could see it. It had a real IP address. Okay. Um, because that's what we did. Right. Because we had so much space, we're like, well, we why would we do anything else? Right. Towards the mid to uh, mid '80s to early '90s, we started hitting what was called IPv4 address exhaustion. Hmm. We had handed out so many addresses, and a lot of them, most of them, weren't actually being used, that we were running out. Right. And people were thinking, okay, we're going to have to switch to IPv6. It's the one that we're using now, which has enough addressing space to give an IP address to every atom in the universe. So we'll never run out again. again. But no, this time we really won't. <laughs> really? Like this we time really, we won't. We really, really won't. Huh. But um, w what we did, instead of switching over, because we're like, oh, well, I don't want to replace all my equipment. Yeah. All my equipment was designed for IPv4. If I do IPv6, I have to replace all my switches. I have to make sure that all my computers can be stacked that way. Right. We did what was called NAT, Network Address Translation. It was recognized that most of your devices mm -hmm. shouldn't have a real internet address. In fact, that was bad. I don't want people to be able to directly access my device. Right, that makes sense. So you should get one and then you, you kind of disperse that amongst your machines? Precisely. Yeah. I need one real address because the internet needs to be able to address my network. Right. I, in order for me to be a router to talk on back this, and forth, yeah. I have to talk back and forth. So I need one real address. But once I've got that one real address, that device, which is my router, mm -hmm. can talk to all the devices behind it. They don't actually need a real world address. Right, right. And so what this meant was I could take a single address and I could turn it into as many uh, computers as I want, any nodes as I want. See, that makes sense because if like, the way I'm imagining it is if you had a house, like you would just have one door to go into the house and then that's yeah. where you have all your stuff instead of just like a bazil like a bunch of doors leading to all the different rooms of your house from yeah. the outside. Yeah. And uh, there was, there, actually that was good for security because it meant that you, if you were trying to hit my network from the outside world, you could see that one, that one device, mm -hmm. but you couldn't see anything else behind Past it. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, right. all right, then the NAT helps take care of that. But what is an open NAT versus a closed NAT? Oh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Oh, okay. We'll get the firewall. Don't worry <laughs> we'll about it. We'll get to that. Yeah. All right. Because there needs to, sometimes, sometimes I do want the internet to be able to hit a device behind that, that layer. Right. Especially right. if it's a gaming machine Especially that you have to, you know, talk on different ports with. Precisely. And so we'll, we'll talk about that okay. when we get the firewall. Okay. But first, I want to go to one of the other features of your router mm -hmm. that most of you probably don't realize is there. Maybe you've heard the name, but you don't know what it does. Mm. It's called DHCP. This is really, really important. Again, back in the day... <laughs> Can we just like go black and white whenever you start talking <laughs> about that? put some lines across the mm -hmm. screen. Yeah, flicker. make it look like VHS. Yeah, change the vertical hold just to make sure we stay in place. Vertical oh, hold? But you got to remember, <laughs> um, when we all had real addresses, mm -hmm. Before DHCP, I had to know all the information for my addresses. I had a notebook, it's not a computer. I had a notebook, oh, that's sad. like with pencil, <laughs> that listed my range, and it was like, okay, which MAC addresses have I associated with which addresses? That was wow. You know, it was a fans crazy fancy system. Oh, I right? bet, yeah. yeah. And then you carry your notebook around with you everywhere. Oh yeah, yeah. and if you lose your notebook, <laughs> you just lost your, your table. Yeah, that's no. bad. <laughs> no, but what DHCP does is it allows a computer, a node, a device 
to request an available address from an, a central authority that mm. will work on that network. And so what it needs to be able to do, it needs to make, uh, keep a table to make sure that it's not giving out an address that another computer is already using. Right. And it also needs to make sure that every once in a while it expires those addresses so that the clients will request a new one just so it could keep it refreshed. Okay. In the old day, you don't see it much anymore, but <laughs> back in like the Windows 98 days, 95 days, people were so accustomed to seeing a little window pop up saying, that IP address is already in use. Contact oh. an administrator. And it's because someone else has jumped onto your IP. <laughs> and it was, it was a cascade. Okay, we're totally getting off the rails. But there yeah. was a cascade effect. Mm -hmm. The people who knew just enough to know where to change that, they're like, well, if someone takes my IP, I'm going to jump on another IP. And then it would just, like, down the chain. Everyone's oh, like, wow. I'm knocked off. Hey, who's it was, like, yeah. snowball kind of effects. Yeah, and so, like, you, you'd have administrators who are like, under no circumstances are you to change your IP address. <laughs> if you have a problem, you call us. We'll come over and see what happened. Okay, okay. So if two machines were trying to use the same IP, then just one would be able to access and the other one would just be like, uh, I can't be addressed to the Internet kind of situation? Well, the last one to request or the last one to take it uh -huh. would actually have priority. Son of a gun. I mean, you gotta, mm -hmm. it's, it's the way that it works. Basically, the, the computer screams at the, at the, uh, uh, at the switch. Yeah. It says, I am this. <laughs> I am this. Mm -hmm. And so all the traffic will be directed to that. And if you have two that are trying to both claim that I am this, yeah. right. whichever one did it last gets the traffic. Okay, okay. It, that, me, not, me, 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 me. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And actually, that's, that's an attack. That still works, and we'll explain that next week. Wow. Yeah. This is cool. It is cool. Uh, DHCP is it's actually a quick process. So we go from um, uh, discovery. And so when you, when you plug in a, a computer, the very first time it, it, it uh, connects, uh, it does it, what's called a DHCP discover. So it sends out, it's a broadcast message. So let's say my network is 192.168.1.1. That's my router. It's going to send Pretty that 255, 255, 255, 255. And that is the special address. That means it's going to send it to everything on the network. Isn't that usually, is that called the subnet mask or something? Like? That's all, Well, that is a subnet mask, but this, okay. one's just, it's, this one's called a broadcast address. Okay. okay. And so when I'm sending something to that, everything on the network is going to get it. And it's basically the client saying, hey, I'm new here. Could I get an address, please? <laughs> and it will wait. And it will wait for someone to give what's called an offer. So you have DHCP discovery, then you have offer. And the offer is the DHCP server saying, oh, hey, Okay, did you want an address? Was that was that you requesting an that address? That was me over here. That yeah, was that, me, yeah. And then it will and then uh, from that it's going to uh, the client is going to do a DHCP request. So it's no longer a discovery but it's a request and the, the client saying, "Yeah, that was me. I need an IP address." And then the server should acknowledge a DHCP uh, it's a, a DHCP acknowledge right sending back to the client okay this is the address that you can use right 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 okay so, okay, so, so that's happening all automatically that's all automatic that's it's a four part same. process that i mean you take it for granted right. it did not always exist and it was so <laughs> much better once we got it so before that would it have before DHCP would it have been what you would call a static address where you had to this is the yep. IP for yeah okay yeah cuz i've had to do static IPs before yeah and that just means right, that that machine always gets that IP address, right? Precisely. Okay. Precisely. Uh, or because sometimes, I mean, we'll explain this when I, I get to next week's episode when okay, we actually okay. set one of these things up. But what I will typically do is I will have a range that DHCP pulls from, and then I will have a range that DHCP doesn't touch. And I know those are my statics. Ah. But I got to maintain my statics. If I drop two on yeah. top of the same address, it's going to be the same problem that we had back in the day. Okay. Smart. I like that idea because, okay. yeah, the issue I would have is I'd turn off a machine and then turn it back on. It would have a different IP uh, if, like, yep. another machine had taken that. Yeah. Fun, fun mm. stuff, right? Okay. <laughs> all right, so we go from that. The third feature that you're going to expect is a firewall. And you hear this all the time. I've got a good firewall. Yeah. It's impenetrable. Do you know what the firewall actually is, Brian? Um, I imagine, like, a Tron situation where it's actually just a wall of fire and the little motorcycles can't <laughs> get through it. Isn't that what it's actually, like? Actually... That, is yeah, that it? Thank you. Sweet. We're done. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you need to know more, please go to our show note. No. See, all the inner workings of computers <laughs> just go back to Tron for me. It's just little people and motorcycles going around, which I like to think about. Yeah. Now, now the firewalls I deal with uh, mm -hmm. are actual firewalls. I mean, like I have one. <laughs> Walls of fire. Well, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> with propane. Yeah. No, uh, but I've got like Sonic Wall, uh, which was Dell. Now it's Sonic Wall again. Uh -huh. Those are enterprise 
class firewalls, which okay. can look at every single packet. And I mean, they're really good with rules. Uh -huh. The firewalls that we build into consumer routers, yes, technically, they are firewalls. They are firewalls. They're just, they're not that advanced. Typically, what they are is they're paired with the NAT, the address, the network address translation, mm -hmm. to, to enable and disable ports. Right, because all the ports open would be bad. That would be bad. Yeah, we don't. We don't. That's what it used to be. It used right. to be when you would plug your computer into the internet, everything was open. It was just like because it's. A I nice, trust you. <laughs> it was like a 1950s happy, like leave it to Beaver neighborhood. Do you compare right? everything to TV? Sometimes. Okay. Yeah, th the things I see on TV. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, uh, but um, so in your consumer router, mm -hmm. your firewall will basically allow you to to open and close ports. Like for example, for your your gaming device. Right you would tell that any traffic I get, the router, so I'm talking my router, any yeah. traffic that my router gets on port 8862 mm -hmm. will get forwarded, and I make a rule, a firewall rule, a routing rule, will get forwarded to the inside of the network to the device that is connected at 192.168.1.5, which is a non-routable address. That address can exist in the real world, right. but it, it does exist in your network. In my network, yeah. Right, and in that case, because there's 65,536 different ports, of which I have access to about 65,000 of them. Oh, <laughs> yeah, more, more. yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah I have cool. a lot. I can, I can make rules, firewall rules, uh, routing rules, mm -hmm. that will take all those different ports and route them to any address I want inside the network. Right. So you have full control then. I do, I do. Which but is nice. I do want those, to, well, we'll, we'll talk about this when we get to security, I want those to be closed by default. I don't want any right. ports open unless I specifically want that communication to take place. Okay, okay. Yeah. The other thing that the firewall will do, on, on better units, you get what's called stateful packet inspection, SPI. Mm -hmm. uh, it will, it's not just the, the rules of where traffic goes, it's looking at the packets for maliciousness malformed headers mm -hmm. the nicer routers like the synology that i'm using right. will act can actually see attacks it knows what a, an attack pattern looks like okay and it will try to keep that traffic out huh so it's so the, i'm imagining all right here's my little <laughs> I'm imagining the packets coming through the router little dump truck mm -hmm. it's like going through and it can there's like key items or there's like things filters that it looks at and it's like oh this is something i recognize that's right. like a bad thing yeah exactly and, and again it all depends on the power some some routers when they say they have stateful packet inspection right. what it really means is the router's going yeah that's a packet yeah, that's a packet. That's a packet. Oh, yeah, that's a packet. <laughs> As they just blow by. Technically, it is, but it's not. So is that really uh, like CPU intensive? Like, is that something? Yeah. Okay. And yeah. so if you do, I guess you would have a nice, have to have a nicer one to. You'd have to have a nice one, or one that notice has, a slowdown. Has built in silicon. Like uh, when I was still doing interop, I worked with a company called C Packet, and that's exactly what they did. They made custom silicon mm -hmm. that could look at every packet in a 10 gigabit connection. Huh. which is a lot. That is a crazy amount. And literally, they could say, search all of these packets as they in real time, as they come in. Don't store them up, but as they come into the network or go out of the network, search right. for anything that says password. And okay. anytime you see a, pass, a packet that contains the word password, stop it. Huh, okay. And that, I mean, that takes, that, it sounds simple. That is an amazing amount of processing power that you need to do that. And to do it quickly, right? It's got to be real time. You can't. Yeah. I mean, it'll add a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of lag if you have the right hardware. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it will just slow you down incredibly. Okay. And you had said malformed header. I'm just kind of curious. What is that? As I can actually... So when, when I'm communicating, I'm sending off a packet of information, mm -hmm. I can compromise someone's poorly configured system by sending a malformed packet that when opened by the router will do something different than what it expected it to do. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, that, I mean, and that's the most layman terms of explanation. Of yeah. <laughs> Explain it to me like I'm five, Padre. Okay, so <laughs> the packet comes into your network <laughs> and it tears off its disguise. It's like, I'm old man Withers and I'm stealing your gems. Curse you, old man. You okay, okay. okay. <laughs> and of course, the last part is wireless, which Duh, we, we know what that does, and we're going right. to cover that when we get over to that part of the Networking 101. Okay. But in a very long nutshell, in a 30-minute nutshell, yeah. that's what your consumer-level router does. And the reason why we did all this, and the reason why this is important, is because you need to understand, when you buy that box, mm -hmm. you're actually buying at least four different devices that back in the day we had to get individually. 
Right, right. It's all in one, and it's probably a lot cheaper than used it's to be. It's a whole lot cheaper. <laughs> but I mean, it also means that you know there were some sacrifices to get everything down in that package. I mean, we used to have to, we used to have to configure our own routers. We used to have to. Uh, build our own NAT box. Mm -hmm. We used to have our own DHCP servers. We used to have our own firewalls, and we all, we had separate access points that we would set up. Right. Uh, now it's all contained within one box, but you still have those discrete components in there. You need to know what they do, and you need to understand what's running because you're going to configure your network the way that you want. That's how you get a high performance, low cost network. Pretty cool. It's it's. I think it's fascinating to know all the different components, but one last question I kind of have about firewall yes. is, isn't there like hardware firewalls and software firewalls? Yeah, and it's, that's exactly what I was talking about. Hardware firewalls have custom designed chips. Okay. Like SonicWall, they build their own silicon. CPacket, they build their own silicon. Even the failed startup that we had uh, not too long, Guardian, mm -hmm. remember Guardian? Yeah. Um, that was a custom ASIC that they had designed just for throughput, because you can design chips just to do one function really, really fast. So instead of, the problem with the software firewall is most of them run on general purpose CPUs. Right. And that means they're never going to be as good at their job as a custom design ASIC, because they've got all this overhead that the custom design ASIC doesn't. But yeah. It's like, I, I, when I'm running a software firewall, I'm running it on top of a CPU that could do everything. It's the happening guy. I could, <laughs> I could be a fireman. I could be an artist. I could be a cop. Right. I can't be any of those things exceptionally well, but I can do everything. Okay. The custom ASIC is like that guy who's like, I sweep. <laughs> and I'm that's really, really good, good at, at sweeping. At, yeah. Like you're, instead of being a jack of all trades, you're the master of sweeping. Precisely. So okay. you, you take silicon and you, you have it so that all it does, like the CPACket example, right. is it does SPI. It okay. can open the packets, look, and send them off. Open the packets, look, send them off. That's what it does. It does it very fast. A yeah. uh, bit more expensive, but mm -hmm. performance, I mean, you, you can't compare them. Okay. Now I'm thinking, because I there's Windows. Windows has firewall built in, right? Or That's different. Is that different? That's so it's different. not like I want to go into my router and turn off the firewall settings in there. Because, no. because I'm like, no. oh, I already have a firewall Don't on my computer, so why would I need to double up? Uh, yeah, the the Windows firewall, it's that's basically just port blocking. Okay. It just makes sure that the services are off that shouldn't be on. Okay. And then asks you, like, do you really want to yeah. open this port? Or? It's okay. it's no, it's good. It's yeah. it's not like junk. Right. Uh, but, but they they're both firewalls. They just do slightly different things. Okay. Cool.